Welcome, welcome, welcome to the living room where we listen, learn, and live together. I'm your host, Richard Martin, and I want to thank you for choosing to spend some time with us together. This has been a transformational experience so far, and today we're in for a dynamic, inspiring conversation. In her book, Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance, psychologist Angela Duckworth speaks to the hard thing, doing the hard thing, that achievement, success, and growth often comes when we push through obstacles. Well, our guest today not only has experience in doing the hard thing, he pursues the hard thing. And I'm excited to have a conversation with Mr. Nathan Faavai, who is a world toughest race, world's toughest race champion and six time adventure race champion. I have here in front of me the litany of his accomplishments, a robust biography that I could read from start to finish. But I have a sneaky suspicion that you, the listening audience, would rather hear more from him than from me. Please welcome to the living room, Mr. Nathan Faavai. Welcome, Nathan. Yeah, kia ora from uh, New Zealand. Thanks for uh, having me on. Listen, I just want to begin by wishing you and your team, who we'll talk about more, a congratulations on successfully completing and winning the world's toughest race, Eco Challenge Fiji. Congratulations. Oh, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, no, we had a, uh, a, a great performance there and our team, team worked superbly well together. So, no, it's very satisfying. Uh, yeah, thank you. So I'm sure that there are some who are listening who are familiar with the World's Toughest Race. For those who are not, again, the World's Toughest Race premiered recently on Amazon Prime and I'm sure other networks, and it highlighted and showcased uh, literally what for me is the World's Toughest Race Eco Challenge Fiji. Um, I just have to ask, from a family perspective, your kids, are they kind of like, your dad's cool, he's on television, or are they, are they not interested at all? <laughs> uh, they are interested. I mean, they're interested in the sport. I guess they've grown up in a household where we do a lot of adventure activities. But, you know, I think that these days, because of technology and social media and, you know, the different platforms available to kids, I think I think being on screen is not kind of what it used to be. Like I know when I was a kid, you know, if you if you saw someone you knew on television, even if it was just in the background, of, you know, they might have been sitting in the audience of a sports game or something. Like it was really exciting. It was like, hey, I saw you on TV. But I think these days, because uh, it's so easy to basically shoot some some video on your phone and post it online, and you know, I, I just don't think there's the same same sort of buzz around it. I guess so. My kids are kind of used to seeing, um, you know, me on, on, on television with races and, and different things. And they've been on. So, no, I don't. It doesn't seem to have the same. Um, they're not that impressed. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that is dad. It's good to see him. Congratulations. But, you know. Yeah. Eat on the panel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we'll talk more about the race in detail as we go on. But I do have a burning question. And, and that is, as we watched you all navigate, as well as I think there were 66 teams who started, what was the bathroom situation like? Inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> when you're out there, well, to be honest, uh, when, you're, when you're doing sort of ultra endurance sport, your body is consuming um, pretty much all the calories that you're putting into it. So it will be fair to say, actually, that you can't do one of those races and not be in a calorie deficit. So essentially you are, whatever you put into your body, you're pretty much using it up. And I'd even go as far as say that in a race that long, which was, you know, at least seven days, your body actually does actually start to cannibalize itself. So everyone that does those races is going to lose a lot of weight. Like your body will start to use all its kind of resources. So to answer your question is the body produces very little waste um, during, during a race like that. But we do go through camps, and at the camps there are facilities, bathrooms available, and often in Fiji we were passing through villages and things as well. But if you caught short, then just kind of, you know, there are there is etiquette to essentially go go you know bathroom sort of in, in the wilderness, and um, there's there's ways to manage that. But but generally speaking, it's it's um, yeah, you just don't don't need to go that much. So right. yeah, you know that's that's such a a 
couch question, right? You know, if, we, if you were out there, you would know the answer to that question. But that's a question for all the persons who were clicking the remote and just watching. I'm sure that was like, you know, and you're probably like, you know, that's the least of our worries while we're out there. <laughs> so let's take a few steps back for those who aren't as familiar with adventure racing or adventure sports at all. What is adventure mm -hmm. activity? What are the adventure sports? And how did you become introduced to it? Yeah, so adventure racing as a sport is a collective of different adventure disciplines. And the sport came about when a group of people, they were actually from France about 30 years ago, decided that they wanted to organise a sporting event that captured um, a real aspect of a journey. So they wanted teams to kind of journey, uh, you know, through, through a, a, I guess, a dynamic or diverse piece of landscape using multiple forms of non-motorised transport. Mm -hmm. So they decided, that, hey, let's organise a race where people will, like, kayak across this lake and then climb over this mountain and then mountain bike down this valley and then climb over another mountain and uh, whatever it is. So they, they, they organised this race and they actually chose New Zealand to be the location where they first launched an adventure race, which was in 1989. Mm -hmm. And uh, for New Zealanders, it was uh, really embraced. And I think that's because, we're, especially where I live in the South Island, a lot of people live here for outdoor sport opportunities. So I'm, look, I'm looking out the window right now and it snowed last night. So I know a lot of friends going up the ski, ski, ski field today. And um, people will, you know, will kayak on the ocean and rivers and lakes. And they'll go hiking in the mountains and trail running and mountain biking and, and doing all these outdoor sports, um, which, which most people will be aware of. And adventure racing, I guess, is just a combination of those things. And it, it, it is essentially a organized expedition for, for a team. You know, if you're interested in outdoor sport, you like being part of a team, you want to obviously challenge yourself, then adventure racing ticks a lot of those boxes. Um, certainly for us in New Zealand, I think it is in our DNA, I think you could say, where we are quite intrepid, like we are a nation of explorers. We like to go and visit places and see new things and, and, and have lots of different experiences. So for me as a young person, having the goal of being a good adventure racer was appealing because it meant that if I was good enough, I would be able to travel around the world and see lots of different amazing things and cultures and wildlife and and lots of that different stuff. So, so yeah, adventure racing literally is about 30, 30 years old, but it combines, it pretty much just combines what I consider to be fairly, fairly normal and accessible outdoor sports. So you begin in around the mid nineties, early mid nineties is when you were first introduced to it in terms of a formal introduction. Yeah, I think that would be fair to say. I, I have always, you know, since I was a teenager, I always had an interest in, and sort of pushing myself in terms of human sort of capability or capacity. I'm not, I don't really know why, but <laughs> I just kind of developed this kind of fascination of how far can the human body go and what can you do? And I started running marathons when I was quite young and kind of doing pretty ambitious uh, hiking trips in the mountains and things. And I just, I just really enjoyed the, the feeling of going out there and, and pushing myself. And around that time when adventure racing first began, I was reading about it in kind of adventure magazines in New Zealand. And I was, I was kind of following what was happening and I always knew that at some point I would, I would get into some adventure racing, but it was in 1999 that I did my first, I actually, I actually stood on the start line of my first adventure race. So in your book, you mentioned a story. You were with some peers out in the mountains and you and another person were responsible for taking another peer back. When they tabulated the distance, that one friend said, hey, you go by yourself, you take this person back, this friend, <laughs> and then you hightail it back, and at the end, you, you figured, looking back, you were awake for, what, 30 hours? That's right, something like that. Yeah, I can't remember the exact time, but yeah, we, <laughs> that's right. We were on a, essentially on a trip with a group and I was a student on that group, and one of the students had severe toothache. And the leaders decided that rather than the whole party go back 
it would be best if uh, one of the tutors took the student back out um, to the nearest road end. And I sort of volunteered to, to go with them because I just kind of figured that sounds like a fun mission. <laughs> and he, as it transpired, the tutor, the tutor who was supposed to be in charge of us two students kind of wasn't traveling fast enough or fit enough. And in the end, they just said to me, look, why don't you just take this student out to the road end and then come back? And so I was like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. That'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. So yeah. for the person who is inspired by the world's toughest race, or even if this is the first time hearing about adventure racing through what you've shared so far, where does one begin if a person doesn't grow up in a place like New Zealand where you can pretty much do all of those sports? Where do mm. they begin? How do they assess their own health? What do you tell people when they ask you, hey, listen, Nathan, I, I want to start. I, I love what you're doing. Where do they start? I think the first place to start is to just look in your region as to what are the outdoor possibilities or opportunities. And obviously, if you live in a big city, um, that's probably a little bit more limiting. But not far from there, there will be things you can do uh, wherever you are, I think, in the world. And I guess the the main thing is really becoming, you know, building up skills and experience in all the different disciplines. So mountain biking, for example, was always part of adventure racing. So starting to ride a mountain bike uh, would be a good start. But, you know, if you don't have a mountain bike, then go and buy one or, or rent one or borrow one or whatever and start, start mountain biking and learn to understand how to mountain bike on trails. I'm not sure about in the United States, but I know in many countries around the world, there's a sport, I'm not sure if you've heard of it, called orienteering, which is, which is kind of running and navigation. And that's a really important skill to learn is how to interpret maps and read maps. And you can do that through hiking as well. Like, uh, you know, I'm sure somewhere close by within a few hours drive, there's probably a forest park or a national park or, or somewhere where there's hiking trails and you can get a map of that area. So going out into the outdoors and, and, you know, with a map and sort of planning a route and going, well, let's, you know, let's hike this circuit today or whatever it may be. So, so that it's really to start building up those core things. And, and I would hope that, you know, if people sort of start doing some research just online, that they'll find, uh, you know, perhaps clubs or organizations that can teach people, um, basic kayaking or stand-up paddleboarding or maybe whitewater rafting, canoeing, whatever it may be, some form of water sport. And then probably close by, I would think that there is some events that people could go and try. So maybe a mountain bike event or a trail running event, hopefully even an adventure race for beginners. Um, you know, there, there, there's usually some one-day events on that people can go and, go and participate in. And I think I could say very, um, you know, with confidence that, that the adventure racing community is very, very welcoming to new people. So if you're a complete beginner and you turn up to an adventure race, um, people will be very, very encouraging and welcoming and, and, and helpful. Sure. That came through on the world's toughest race. There were those who were new to Eco Challenge and then there were those such as your team this wasn't your first rodeo. And I did get a sense of that chemistry. Um, I'm assuming that a lot of it was organic. Hey, you know, I recognize you, any advice, and you all were very willing to share and give tips. So it goes without saying that this is a hard sport. And I don't use that word so as to intimidate listeners, but it seems like to some degree, you like, if I can use that word, the hardship. There is something... Um, in inviting to you about the suffering component. So my question is, what does that mean to you? You said you don't really know why. From the time you were young, teenager, <laughs> there was something fun about taking a mate <laughs> back to the road and then coming back. What about the suffering, the hardship has shifted in your mind to where you don't run away from it, but you run to it? Yeah, I think... I think there's lots of ways I could answer that question. And, and, I, and I think if you ask me the same question any different day, I'll probably give a slightly different, different answer. But I think, you know, for me, I really enjoy simple living. And, uh, you know, I regularly go out into the wilderness and, you know, with, with friends or by myself or with, family, with my family, we, we spend a lot of time in the wilderness. 
And I really love that simple living where, you know, we're, in New Zealand especially, um, you know, we, we, we're, we're basically sleeping on the ground, we're cooking on fires, uh, we're drinking out of the streams, you know, there's fresh air, there's no Wi-Fi, there's often no, no mobile phone coverage. And life is very simple. You know, what we have uh, with us at those times is really what we've just carried on our backs. And one of the things I like about that simplicity as well is, is that when you're out in nature, you know, you're exposed to different things. If, uh, you know, if it's a very hot day, then you have to just basically manage the heat. Or if a storm comes in or a snowstorm and it's cold, then you have to manage, manage that cold. So while I, while I kind of enjoy, uh, I guess, being in those elements and, and essentially the, you know, there are times when you are out there and you're, you know, you're suffering and, 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 and having to deal with um, discomfort you are actually trying to make yourself as comfortable as you can in that environment. Like you're not deliberately, like if I'm out in the mountains and it gets cold, then I'll be the first one to put gloves and a hat and a jacket on to stay warm. So it's not like I'd sort of deliberately go out there to kind of punish myself, but I do like being in that environment that's very real and very simple. And, you know, you do have a very strong connection, um, you know, with nature. I think the, reciprocate of that is is that you know when i'm home here in our house you know we have hot water we have unlimited food we have shelter roof warmth comfortable beds um, we have all these comforts and for me i i kind of i really love having those things but in order to kind of love having those things i need to regularly be reminded of how lucky we are to have those things you know, I, I like the fact that I, you know, after this, I can get up and go and make myself a coffee without having to light a fire. But without having those experiences in the wilderness, I find that I just take all these things for granted. And for me personally, I find that when I find, when I take all these things for granted, I don't know, I kind of feel like life takes on a bit of numbness. Like I sort of lose the, kind of loses edge a bit. So for me, it's really important to to go out and, and experience those, have that connection with nature. And, and I think, you know, for our team, obviously, you know, because we've been doing so much of this stuff throughout our lifetimes, for us to go and kind of to be challenged and to really be walking close to that edge, we do actually have to go and do something fairly extreme, like world's toughest race. Yeah. Um, but for a lot of the listeners here, they don't need to go and do that. <laughs> they can they can get the same they can get achieve the same outcomes by just setting their own goals relative to where they're at. So you know, someone listening might go, "Well, I mean, I saw the world's toughest race, and a I actually don't want to do that, and b I probably never could," which may or may not be true. But there will be something they can go and do that will essentially achieve the same thing. So I, I'm glad you mentioned that because toward the end of the series, as depicted on television, there was that spot where you, you said this was the slash a world's toughest race for me and for others racing, but this doesn't have to be your world's toughest race. Hmm. And, you know, I definitely wrote that down quickly. <laughs> I said that's a, that's a powerful you know, principle for the actual race that you just completed, but also a life principle, because it's easy to get into the comparison game. And mm. if you're not careful, you can see what someone else accomplished based on their experiences, based on their skill set, and a number of other variables. And depending on who is doing the observation, you can, man, just, you know, say to yourself, I'll never do that. I'll never be able to complete the world's toughest race. And therefore, I am ABC. Mm. But what you offered was no, this is not the only toughest race. Yes, my team has completed this race, but please believe we could turn on the television tomorrow and see another form of achievement or another um, huge life endeavor. And we would True. say, I don't know if I could do that. So I think that principle is very compelling and I appreciate you sharing that. Absolutely. Uh, to the idea of appreciating the comforts of home, the commodities of, of modern living, by engaging nature. You, you posted recently on Instagram about the 2015 race and help me pronounce the name correctly, Pantanal, is that correct? That's right, yes. 
And I'll be honest, Nathan, I read a portion of your caption and as you were writing, I said, oh, I like this, I like this, I like this. And then you said we were living, not with, but we were, we were kind of respecting nature and you mentioned anacondas, Nathan, Nathan, <laughs> Nathan. That's where you lost me. I was gonna be your teammate, but I said, okay, I'm sorry, I can't be your teammate. All jokes aside, when it comes to the interaction with wildlife, how do you, and, and really nature in general, I'm sure there is an interdependence. There is a respect level. You're not going out there acting, you know, wild or, or crazy or being negligent. But the reality is there are creatures, there are types of plants, and on and on and on in different places. How do you get into the headspace to say, if I am paddling, yes, there's a crocodile, but I can't freak out. How do you do that for you and your team? Yeah, so we... we often are in areas and parts of the world where there's dangerous, you know, dangerous wildlife around. But from our experiences is, is that when you're in the true wilderness environments and especially remote places like Pantanal, the, the wildlife, most wildlife is actually not aggressive. Uh, I mean, there may be some stuff in parts of Africa that, you know, I might change my mind about that, <laughs> but most of the places we go, the wildlife is actually running away from us as opposed to running towards us. So we generally feel lucky to see the wildlife we do when we're out there racing. I mean, there's four of us, you know, we're kind of making a reasonable amount of noise. I guess our scent is, is really different to most wildlife. So most of the time when we see things, it's kind of something actually like scattering, like they're actually trying to leave or hide or do something. The other thing that we've experienced or found is, is that, in the really remote uh, places in the world we've raced where there's quite a lot of wildlife, there's almost like this mutual respect that we're all out there together. And we've, to my knowledge, I've never felt threatened by any wildlife out there. We've come quite close to some fairly dangerous things. And, and, and they've, you know, we've been aware that they've been watching us or monitoring us. But it's almost like they're just going, oh, that's interesting. There's kind of four people walking past. <laughs> I've never seen that before. Um, and then they just kind of move away, you know. Uh, and, and you're right, because we're not, we're not hunting or we're not chasing them or we're not, um, you know, we're being very respectful and we're being, we're being sensible around, around these creatures. Um, but I, I think sometimes you just have to go, well, you know, we chose to come out here and we know the risks. And, yeah, if we, if we start to get... Um, yeah, you know, harassed by some of this, this wildlife, then we're going to need to sort of, you know, be defensive and try and scare, scare things away or, or do things. But, you know, we've never, we've never had to. We've, we've always been felt just quite blessed to kind of have the, all the wildlife experiences that we have had in races. So the world's toughest race shared with us, the viewing audience, that there had been a kind of interlude between the last Eco Challenge and the one in 2019. Two-part question uh, A would be, what happened if you're at liberty to share why there was that interlude and then b i know that you for a season kind of took a step aside and pursued some other ventures what was the draw to the eco challenge in 2019 for you so a and b yeah so the eco challenge uh started i think around the mid 90s i, I think roughly around 90, 90, 1995 and in 2002 uh um, there, there was an annual event, and uh, after the race in 2002, which was in Fiji as well, they announced that uh, they would be taking a break. They weren't sure when they would run another Eco Challenge. Now, I actually don't know why. I don't actually know the official reasons why. But the rumours at the time were, the main rumour was is that Mark Burnett, the producer, had, had during the time of Eco Challenge, had started the Survivor show, which was going really well. And, and it kind of made sense. The story on, in the, in, within our sport was is that, you know, the Eco Challenge World Toughest Race, I mean, it's a huge thing to organise. You know, 66 teams, the course is open for like 12 days, um, you know, spread over 500 miles, whatever it is versus running survivor <laughs> which is you basically take 10 people I, to be honest i've never seen an episode but i you know I'm, they take about 10 people to one location they do some fairly simple kind of tests and initiatives and um the budget is probably way way smaller but the audience is way bigger so 
I think there was just some logical kind of business decisions that why organize Eco Challenge <laughs> when, we can, when we can run Survivor? And uh, so that was the main thing. But I, I suspect also that it was ratings dependent. Like I think had the ratings been great, um, I think it would have stuck around. So from what I understand is that they were, they were having trouble um, keeping, keeping the audience interested in um, an Eco Challenge. So that, that's pretty much all I kind of know. So then, um, yeah, so Eco Challenge stopped, but the sport continued. Um, there was many other events. There's a World Series. There's, there's World Championships. Uh, there's lots of things going on around the world. So our team was like, okay, well, that's a shame. Eco Challenge has stopped, but okay, we'll just go and do other, other races. During that, during that time, I guess, uh, you know, nearly, nearly 20 years, uh, I have pretty much been racing uh, pretty much most of that time, like, through but i have taken a couple of breaks from racing i think though for memory that um there's probably only been one maybe two years during that period where i haven't done a race mm. uh, but at certain it's just at certain times i've had different different sort of focuses to be honest i actually have tried to stop racing a couple of times but it has been unsuccessful yeah something yeah. keeps drawing you back in so correct me if I'm wrong, adventure racing is not singularly team-based. A lot of your accomplishments have also been solo adventure endeavors. Am I correct? Uh, it, adventure racing, it, uh, by definition, is definitely a team sport. Okay. Uh, but we do have some very similar things that are individual. So uh, in New Zealand, you can essentially go and do, I guess what it, at face value looks like an adventure race for individuals but in New Zealand, that is we actually call that multi-sport. Okay. So that's a different, a different, different thing. So no, um, for most people in adventure racing, when you when you when you say the words adventure racing, they are thinking a team. It's a team. That's a team sport. But uh, a team can be between, can be anywhere between races. I know two and eight people in a oh. team. It's it's normally four, but it it, it can change. So my wife and I often say when we're watching, you know, Survivor, The Amazing Race, World's Toughest Race, and anything that has that broadcast element, that for the racers, there is no music. You've seen, <laughs> you've seen the episodes and, you know, the cuts are perfect. The drama is great. You know, the cliffhangers are dynamic. But when you're out there, there's no music. It is you and your team. So again, two-part question. The first would be, were you or your team, were you ever, you know, kind of annoyed with the camera personnel asking you questions at maybe inopportune times? And did that have to, was that kind of another element to think through on the race? And the second part would be, um, well, actually, let me pause. That'll be the first, and then I'll get to the second part. Cool. Yeah, to be honest, um, sometimes the cameras around um, could be a little bit, a bit, you know, just a, a bit invasive. And uh, I think our team, well, I not think, I know our team is quite a private team. Like we, one of the things we really look forward to in these races is actually getting separation from the rest of the teams. Yeah. And part of that is obviously because, you know, we're trying to race and, and in, in order to probably win a race, at some point you need some separation. But But more importantly for us, it's about, you know, just being in a small group and making our way through the wilderness um, with a little bit of intimacy. You know, we just like to be together as a team and, and, and problem solve by ourselves and not be distracted by other teams. And, and, and I think in many ways, just retain that, that kind of feeling that you are actually on an on a expedition. You know, this is us versus the course versus the elements, you know, sort of thing. So... Eco Challenge is quite different to most races because there's lots of film crews around. There's helicopters flying around <laughs> just about all the time during uh, during daylight hours. I mean, Bear Grylls pops up, you know, and there's high. <laughs> and, um, and and a lot of the time we have a camera camera crew camera person with us. And while they are very respectful and and really try and and not interfere with, I guess, the team dynamics, it, it does make a difference. 
So we we do find it sometimes a little bit a little bit intense, but at the same time we know that in that race that's what it's about, and you can't have both. You can't capture the story to go and tell the world and not have those camera crews there. So so we definitely make a, a big effort to to be as accommodating as and as helpful as we can. We kind of know that if we can help those crews do their job, then they're going to help to tell that event racing story to the world, which ultimately is, is, is great. There were a few times uh, where we did say to the camera crew that we just need a little bit of space. And during, and whenever we did that, they were hugely respectful. And so, yeah, it was, it was okay. And to the camera personnel, the team, projection team and bear, if you all ever hear this, this is, we are very supportive and we do appreciate uh, all that you all have done to capture and tell the story. And I could, I would imagine that listeners get that. You, you have this focal point from a race standpoint, but then also you, when you signed the dotted line or whatever agreement, everyone was aware that this is a part of it. So we were very grateful because it's easy to forget that in some of those environments, the camera crew is in the cold water too, or they are in the mud as well. So, you know, huge shout out to them. Speaking of, again, wanting to maintain an intimate environment, create some separation, another philosophical point that emerged from you and your team that I thought was compelling was locating and taking advantage of the race winning opportunities. How do you discern what that is when it's upon you in this particular race that was around the Avua Falls. You all made a calculated decision. Night is upon us, but we're going to go climb and we're going to proceed. Was that your doing? Was it, did it emerge from a team conversation? How do you know when it's a race winning opportunity and how did you know that was it for you on this particular challenge? Sure. So, um, yeah, so you, you're right. So w- whenever we're racing, um, you know, we are always looking for uh, an opportunity to essentially break a break fr- break from the pack. And most of the time that is my role as not necessarily team captain, but I would be the main team strategist. Um, but I'm not making those decisions on my own. What I'm essentially doing is putting forward ideas to the team and then we're just discussing them as we go. So often I'll sort of be thinking, okay, this is, uh, you know, this is what's happening in the race. Um, this is what's coming up. This is what we've done. This is how much sleep we've had. Uh, you know, these disciplines that we've got ahead of us, I perceive to be our strengths or potentially our weaknesses, whatever it may be. And then sometimes, not always, but sometimes we're lucky enough to get a bit of a bit of a feel for how the other teams are. And why I say lucky enough, because sometimes we actually don't know uh, what's happening with the other teams because we just don't, we haven't seen them. And so we have to make decisions based on the information that we have. So, and, and it doesn't always work. Like sometimes we may decide that, okay, here's an opportunity that I think if we try this, this could be, this could sort of essentially become our race winning break. And, and sometimes they don't. So sometimes you try something and it goes, oh, that didn't work. Okay, let's just go back to a holding pattern and look for the next window. But it'd be fair to say, when I, now that I've said that, <laughs> that most of the time when we collectively agree that now's, now's the good time, now's a good time, let's have a go, um, most of the time it, it actually works for our team. And, and I think that's just a reflection of the, live, the experience that we collectively bring together. So in, in that time, you're, you're dead right in that after the camp, I, I can't even remember what camp it is, I think it was camp three, before the Vavua Falls section, we had decided that morning that we, would, that we were going to push all through the night, that we were going to take on the falls that night. And, and there was a few reasons for that, that we decided that would be a good thing to do. But it was kind of, um, you know, as the day went on, we actually saw quite a few teams that day. Um, that was a stage where we were allowed to use support from local Fijian villages. And we saw a number of teams that day and we started to kind of sort of see how they were. And while they were racing strong, we started to notice that in most of the teams around us, not all four team members were 
sure. were kind of racing strong. So we figured, so for us, that was just sort of just cemented our decision that, um, you know, tonight's going to be, you know, we were mentally prepared to go to go through the night. And we figured that if we could do that and do it well, that that would essentially just put us ahead and, and, and sort of put us out of rhythm with the rest of the teams um, in the race. Most of the teams that were showcased at the top of Abu Falls going into those freezing cold waters, at best you had maybe two or three scenes that a team, they showed them getting in, they showed them struggling through, and then they showed them shivering afterwards. <laughs> what was, I mean, again, we only saw a snapshot. I can imagine that was a long time in the water. Nathan, what was that like? How did you keep your head? And after you're done between finishing the pool section and getting to the checkpoint, are you and your team talking? We see that you all were shivering. Is it just a silent what trek? So, man, I mean, it just looked cold, but as one who finished it, how did you all get through the pools? Yeah, it was, it was cold. Uh, oh, <laughs> shivering again. <yeah. laughs> uh, I think, I think, you know, uh, we, we sort of, we, 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 I guess we knew what was coming up. Like we had been warned that, um, you know, we're going to be swimming these cold pools and things. So we had taken a little bit of extra gear in preparation for that. But I, you know, over the years with these races and, and our own, just our own experiences in the wilderness, like I think our team and, and, and many other teams in the race as well, you kind of learn a lot about just mental attitude and mindset. And I think, you know, one thing I kind of picked up when I watched that part of the show is, is that, you know, our team, it, you know, was quite matter of fact. You know, we were, I mean, I was pretty much standing there and the camera guy sort of said to me, you know, what's up sort of thing. I was like, oh, it looks like we have to trail ends here. We start swimming, you know. And then they talked to Sophie and she's making some joke about, you know, going for a morning swim. And for most of that swim section our team would have actually been making jokes and laughing and and um keeping it jovial you know we, we would be suffering but we would just be making sure that we're not letting the the challenge beat us you know i think we've learned over the years that if you you know if you fall into sort of a negative mindset or if you start to believe the task is that hard then it kind of makes it more real. But if you kind of joke about it and have a bit of fun with it and sure, you know, you're hiding the fact that it's actually totally miserable. But um, if you can sort of stay on top of it, you can just get through things that much better. Uh, We were absolutely freezing by the end of it, but I think we got out just in time. Um, You know, we, we sort of paced ourselves well through there and there was a, it was a reasonably short walk from the time we finished swimming to the time we reached the checkpoint. And, and I think during that walk, yeah, we were just kind of just shivering away, silently suffering, but knowing that very soon we're going to be warmed up and we'll be back back into things. But, uh, yeah, we were, that would have probably been the – I mean, I wouldn't say it was the hardest part of the race, but it was definitely the, the – uh, you know, it was miserable. Like, it wasn't fun. <laughs> sure. I think that the storytellers did a good job of allowing us to kind of have a window or a snapshot into some of the off course realities for a lot of the teams. Uh, There was a military vet who due to an interaction on deployment went deaf, became deaf. Uh, There was the father's son who were kind of going on that excursion together, the father experiencing Alzheimer's, stray dogs, you know, a team that had been at it for a while. One thing that many viewers, might not know is that you raced not just eco challenge but for a number of years with a heart condition atrial fibrillation what is that and how are you still racing after (laughs) diagnosis and if i'm not if i'm not mistaken three corrective surgeries uh yes i yeah that's that's true um yeah well actually two corrective surgeries i've had three heart surgeries but the first one was actually unsuccessful. It actually made my condition worse. But uh, thankfully, the last two have actually been good. So it sounds a lot worse than it is. So yes, I have a condition called atrial fibrillation, which is essentially an electrical heart arrhythmia problem. So what it does is, is that um, in my heart has developed in a way 
where, for whatever reason, um, has decided that, um, you know, that the muscle tissue needs to grow in certain areas and do certain things. I don't fully understand, the, 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 I guess, the, well, the, I don't understand it fully. Uh, so mine was ex exercise-induced atrial fibrillation. So what that means is, is that when I start exercising, uh, my body, uh, my brain, basically does a bit of a, a um, process and goes, right, we need to supply more oxygen to the muscles. So in order to do that, we need to start, you know, turning the heart up and start pumping harder. So what happens is that that electrical signal goes to my heart and tells the heart to start pushing more oxygen around the body. But because of the way my heart has actually grown over the years, the electrical signal gets confused mm. and the heart pretty much freaks out, almost it's essentially a muscle spasm. So rather than sort of beating, you know, whatever, I don't know, 180 beats a minute, what can happen with my heart is it kind of goes into a panic attack and it can start beating up to about 400 beats a minute. So mm. it basically just goes into a, a huge, um, you know, fibrillation. So what that means for me <laughs> is, is that when your heart is trying to beat that fast, it, it is basically not pumping blood efficiently. Like it, it's not. And so, so my, my, what it's trying to do is supply oxygen to the muscles, but because it's not beating properly, almost it does has almost a reverse effect in that almost no oxygen is getting to my muscles. So that means that, um, that I have to essentially stop what I'm doing, or sometimes I don't even have the energy to stand up. Like I actually have to lie down because, because, because my muscles are basically just not, not functioning. And then that can put the body under all sorts of other stress. Um, most of the time with my condition is my heart would uh, eventually reset itself. So once I actually lay down, you know, for a while, the heart will kind of balance things out and it will return to some level of normality. But, in some occasions it hasn't done that mm -hmm. and I would need to actually get to a hospital and get essentially um, the electric paddles to shock the heart back into normal rhythm. It's not considered life threatening, my condition, uh, but it is very, very difficult to be an athlete and have that, have that condition because it means that a lot of the time I, if I was to go out training, I basically couldn't, couldn't train. So I have to, I have to go home and mentally that is hard as an athlete when I know sometimes maybe 20 or 25% of your training is compromised or not possible. You know, it's, it's difficult to, to be, to maintain a, a, a positive outlook as an athlete when you know, you're not doing the training that's required. So over my career, yeah, I've had three corrective surgeries. Um, two of them have been successful. The last one was in 2014. And, um, and since then I have been fine. Like I have, I have some occasional little issues, but most of the time I'm fine. I don't expect the, um, surgery to last forever. I suspect at some point the condition will probably come back and I'll need to go back in for more, more treatment. Um, if I, if I continue to try and keep racing. And at no point did you consider, or maybe were you made to consider, I don't know, maybe by a family member or a friend, hey, Nathan, you've had a good run, let's dial it back. Or is there something in you that says, I'm sorry, you know, I'm going to find a way to harmonize this reality with my passion? Yeah, that's right. I think, I think I've always felt that, um, you yeah, know, I've, I've definitely got a pathway that I, how I'd like to live my life <laughs> and whatever it kind of takes to stay on that pathway. I'm fairly, fairly determined to do that. I, you know, when I first got the condition sort of when I first found out about it and, um, you know, 20 years ago, uh, I did go through a little bit of a soul searching period, you know, asking the question, you know, is it worth it? Is it worth, you know, when I had a young family and, and, um, you know, do I need sport in my life? Do I need to race? Do I need these things? And while I came to the conclusion that I don't, um, I decided that, you know, I would still like that. I would, that would be my preference. So, so yeah, I talked to lots of doctors and, and you know, the, the medical crew here in New Zealand, and they gave me confidence that, sure, you know, we can get you back out there racing. And it actually became a bit of a challenge for the medical team that I was working with 
Um, you know, I think, you know, that they've said this themselves, you know, a lot of people they're dealing with with heart problems are often elderly or people that don't look after themselves. And, you know, as soon as they get their heart fixed, they're back out doing the same things that put them in hospital in the first place. I think they found it quite exciting that, you know, I was trying to get myself fixed so I can go out there and sort of race <laughs> internationally at the top level of my sport. So, yeah, I think, I think they've, they've quite enjoyed kind of being part of that journey. So you get an opportunity that many people dream of. You get paid to do what you love. Um, I sense that in many respects, a lot of that had to do with your parents recognizing in you, you know, kind of a adventurous, adventurous spirit, maybe kind of a more, you know, this one, we need to kind of extend his leash, right? <laughs> Man, what did mom and dad mean to you? What do they mean to you even now? Sure. Yeah. So now I think, uh, you know, the, the really amazing thing I, I think about my parents is, is that they supported me and my brother and sister to really just follow our dreams, mm. you know, whatever, whatever it w is we wanted to do. Um, they were just like, sure, if that's what you want to do, we'll support you to do that. And the other thing I think was very unique about my mother, she was an educationalist and for her time, she was very, very liberal. And she gave us an incredible amount of freedom. And while I think at times, you know, that led us down some, some roads that, you know, probably weren't the best, but they were great learning opportunities. I think really what that freedom did was enable us to not put limitations on ourselves. You know, we, we sort of saw the world as this place that, you know, there's all, whatever you want to do, go out there and, and chase it. And whether or not you achieve it or not doesn't really matter as long as you are on the pathway that is inspiring you and excites you and makes you want to get up each day and pursue things. So I feel very fortunate for that. Uh, my father was just a very, very keen sports person. And whatever sport um, we were doing, he was just like, yeah, go, <laughs> go for it. You know, like that, that's awesome. Just get out there and and, and do these things. So, uh, so yeah, I do feel very, very fortunate for that. And, and uh, to mention, you said, um, you know, like we get uh, you're paid to do or, you know, essentially event racing. Now, we're not professional event racers. I have been a professional event racer, but I'm not anymore. So, so all our team are actually working pretty much, pretty much full-time jobs. We have a lot of flexibility in what we do though. Like three of us are self-employed. So, um, you know, we do have to fit, fit our sport around our work and, and different things. So we, we are very lucky enough to be sponsored. We have some great sponsors, but, but we do have, you know, to put food on the table, um, we, we are working as well. So there are many people who would love to race with you because they might assume that he can get me to the finish line, <laughs> right? <laughs> no pressure. Um, but of course, from a team composition standpoint, you just don't race with anyone. So you, Stu Lynch, Chris Forn or Forney? Forn. Chris Forn um, and Sophie Hart make up team. It was formerly Seagate. What's the name now? Well, uh, yeah, we, in the world's toughest race, obviously, we were, we were Team New Zealand. Right. But our main sponsor at the moment is Avaya, which is another, another American uh, corporate. Um, so, yeah, we... we in all the other races we do, we're Team Avea, but sure. at World Toughest Race, we were Team New Zealand. So how do you select, how did this team come to be? Uh, what, is your, what is your leadership philosophy? I know it's a team endeavor. You're the team captain. So to some degree, even if you are, well, let me not get ahead of myself. What's your, what's your leadership philosophy? If there is a, a call that, that ends up not being the best call, how do you own that as a leader? And then also when you sense, okay, our morale's kind of being challenged right now, whether because of just the extreme activity that we are in or maybe some interpersonal communication things, how do you lift that morale? There are a lot of leaders who, again, they might not do that world's toughest race, but there are some life lessons in there from a team perspective. So could you speak to that for us? Sure, sure. So going back, uh, how did the team come together? So um, in New Zealand, the event racing community is quite small. Like um, there's obviously 5 million people live in New Zealand, but if you actually break down kind of the adventure races, you know, you, you're starting to talk about a user group of, of, I'm not sure, you know, it'd still be thousands and thousands of people. But when you get to the elite level, 
you're starting to talk, you're looking at an audience or a group of people that's maybe only, you know, maximum maybe 200 people. And, and when I say that 200 people, these are people that could go to world's toughest race and, and finish that race, um, you know, quite comfortably. Yeah. So within that pool of people, we essentially kind of form teams um, from that. And, and we're all mostly good friends <laughs> um, within that group. Um, but obviously there's a lot of competition going on as well. So, so in our team, and, and I guess it is um, largely kind of my, my way, but supported by my teammates. But we, we are known as a team that has a lot of continuity. So what you often see in the sport is team composition changing a lot from race to race. So in one race, you'll see some people racing together, and then you might see them in another race three months later in a different country in different teams racing against each other. So often, often athletes will just kind of jump from team to team, uh, depending on lots of different things. But in our team, we've always had a very strong belief um, that – we keep the team together as much as possible. And, and there's lots of reasons for that. You know, what one is, is that, you know, the more we race together, the better we get. Uh, it also means that the learning that we, we uh, develop or we, you know, we compile stays within the team. So we sort of start to get, I guess, some sort of trade secrets that, that only we know about. Mm -hmm. And then I think as people, we, we learn more about each other. You know, every race we do, um, you know, we, 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 we become closer. So, so the team starts to take on much more of a family uh, atmosphere and culture because we've just had so many shared and in, intense experiences together. So our team has essentially just evolved really since 2011. And, and, and one of the things that's very important for me and the team is that when we put the teams together, that obviously we need people that can go the distance. But like I said, in New Zealand, there's plenty of people that can go the distance. Um, we obviously need specific skills, um, you know, doing the different things. So, so for us, it's about making sure that we've got the skills that we need, making sure we've got people um, that can go the distance. Uh, but for me, it's more about putting a team together that uh, will look after each other like family. And, and that's essentially what we've achieved in our team. As a leader, I guess as, as team captain, you my main, the one word I would use to describe my aspirations uh, as a leader would be composure. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen go wrong in adventure racing is when people kind of panic, uh, when they rush to make decisions, um, when they say things without thinking, when they... You know, just I, I guess they just do things that aren't that well thought through. So after years of racing and actually doing those things myself as a team captain and regretting things over the years, the thing I came to learn is that composure is extremely important in that, you know, staying calm and composed and cool with everything is hugely important, especially in an adventure race when you can almost guarantee the you haven't planned for is coming right your way like like things go wrong <laughs> in adventure racing i mean keeping four people healthy for seven days keeping mountain four mountain bikes working not making navigational mistakes not you know being succumbed to weather weather conditions being in an environment a competitive race environment where it feels like sometimes where every other team in the race just wants to beat you um, there's all these things happening so it's really easy to get rattled and to you know, essentially not be your best, you, the best you can be. Um, so for me, it's all about composure. So it's all about just keeping cool and just taking some time and just taking a deep breath and going, right, okay, something actually quite bad's happened right here, you know, in terms of the race, I guess. Um, what are we going to do about it? Let's just kind of methodically look, look through these things. And what I've kind of also learned in that leadership style is, is that, the sooner you can accept and adapt and adjust, the, the better. Because 
So, so in our team, we have this kind of saying uh, or this philosophy of kind of solution-based thinking. So if something goes wrong, so for example, we've had lots of things go wrong in races. You know, someone does something a little bit silly on their mountain bike and breaks a part on their mountain bike. And my initial thought is, well, that was dumb. I mean, <laughs> that was just dumb. <laughs> but I know that on day four of an adventure race, where we've only had a few hours sleep, and then, and then we're in this race, we're in this high pressure environment for all these reasons. For me to say to my teammate, what you did right now was dumb, is not going to be helpful. Um, we may talk about it after the race, uh, in which case I still wouldn't use those words, but I'd say, hey, how could we have avoided that? But we've learned that at the time, the faster you can go to just uh, to, to solving the problem is actually what you need to do. So in that situation, it's not like, hey, man, what a dumb thing to do. Look, you've broken your bike. It's kind of like, hey, we have a broken bike. How are we going to fix this bike? And you're pushing aside all the, um, all the behavior. You're pushing aside anything personal. All you're dealing with is the physical problem that the team now has. And most of the time, you'll find that if you have that, that person doesn't feel bad because they just feel like, hey, look, all four of us are kind of trying to fix this bike usually you can fix a thing something in no time and then you just carry on and um and, and everyone's cool and happy and, and you just kind of keep focused and, and doing what you do so yeah certainly for me it is is composure mm -hmm. the other thing you sort of mentioned <clears throat> is if things do go wrong or as a captain if we make the wrong decisions you know i think kind of related to that like i i think in all areas of life uh, and certainly in teamwork that having the ability to take ownership and responsibility and accountability for things is hugely important. And I think most teams become dysfunctional when one or two or members of the team are not willing to, to do that. They're not willing to take ownership for things that they've done that have been unhelpful or they're unwilling to kind of put their hand up and say, hey, look, what we did actually or what I did has actually has actually negatively impacted the team. You know, often in that environment, everyone knows what the problem has been. <laughs> and all they really want is for the person involved just to say, guys, I'm sorry, I, um, that was bad. I sh shouldn't have done that. And then everyone can just move on. But when the person's kind of in denial or worse, is trying to transfer that responsibility to someone else, then that's where you get conflict and friction happening. So for me as a team captain, it's very important to role model that. Like if I do something wrong, man, I'm like, I'm the first to go far out, man. That was bad. That was stupid. You know, I'm um, <laughs> sorry, guys. And everyone's, and usually, and then we, all the time, teammates are like, man, don't worry about it. It's fine. It's fine. We'll overcome this. You know, that's, we, we can move, we can get over this. We can move through it. Don't feel bad. Let's just, let's just carry on, you know, and there might be a high five and a hug and share some food around and you move on. But you know, so I think I think it's really important. Um, you know, not just for the team captain, but for everyone to kind of take up those roles. And and I trust my teammates. Um, you know, to do that all the time. So I'm not a father yet. Uh, hope to be one day. And I can imagine that a lot of the principles and lessons that you've gleaned in adventure racing, you know, they kind of in many ways mirror things that you might want to implement in life. So you're not only an adventure racer, you're a husband and a father, right? Yeah. How have you grown in that family space? Like you said, early on, you were kind of also forming a new family. So things have kind of been concurrent to some degree. How have you grown? And um, how do you harmonize doing what you love? Like you said, I spend a lot of time out, but I also need to be with my family. And the, the privilege has been that to, to some degree, your family also enjoys the outdoors. So what has your growth experience been like? And how do you instill these lessons and values into your children? Um, do they want to do adventure sports or are they kind of like, that's your thing, we'll do ours. And even if they don't, again, how do you instill these values and life lessons to them? Sure, sure. So I think uh, one thing that came to mind just on the back of my last uh, rant about captaincy and composure is, is that one phrase that I took from adventure racing that I took into fatherhood was that nothing will shock me and it's about the composure thing so so what I what I wanted to do with my family is my kids is build a relationship with my kids that at any stage of their lives if they come up to me and say hey dad 
I've got a bit of a problem. I've got something to tell you. And they share it with me. I've always been very, very disciplined to have that philosophy that nothing will shock me. So no matter what they say, even if my reaction is kind of like, what? (laughs) I'm just like, oh yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, tell me more. You know, um, that's a curious thing. And I think it's really important because, um, you know, that as a team captain, but also, but more importantly, as a father or, you know, a, a, you know, a business person, whatever it is, I think you need to keep those channels of communication open and accessible. And you need to, you need to be certainly as an, as a father and a, and a team captain, you need to be approachable. You know, the teammates need to know that they can come to you with anything and you're not going to kind of lose it. And, um, you know, just, just, just fly off the handle. And so that's one thing that I've, there's many things I've taken from, I've learned from sport and racing and my career that I've brought into fatherhood, but that's a big one. In terms of uh, my kids in the outdoors, uh, we have, you know, one of the blessings of being an adventure racer and the career path that I've chosen is, is that there are many times when I'm overseas racing, I can be away from the family sometimes for a month at a time, not so much anymore, but, but you, you know, during my career, the upside is, is that when I'm actually home, I can be extremely present for long periods of time. And so I can, I can basically be, I can change my weeks around to do stuff with the kids that most fathers wouldn't get to do. I can go on, you know, school trips with them for the day. Um, you know, I can be home after school. I, I try and be home, you know, when they get home from school every day so we can go and do things or just that I'm around for them if they need it. So I can kind of, move my schedule around and do my training while they're at school and things um, so that, um, you know, so in terms of actually contact time with um, my family, I feel like it's probably more than if, than than someone who would have a regular job added to that. I think uh, my wife who is also uh, works in in the outdoor industry or she's an outdoor educator. That's my, that's kind of my real job is, is that we place high value on, on, on spending a lot of time as a family and we're very protective of our family time. And that family time is nearly always about going away into the wilderness, doing family trips. And we're always going and doing things. So my kids have sort of grown up in that environment that they don't actually know much different. Like they have just done years and years and years now of outdoor adventure trips. So they are very capable in the outdoors and now that they're all teenagers, they're starting to pick and choose more about what they like and what they don't like and, and different things. But the one thing that we really wanted to instill in them was uh, we wanted them to have, uh, you know, we don't care if they're not event racers or athletes or sports people, that's not important to us. But what we did want them to do is to know that um, the wilderness is out there for them and that at any stage of their lives, if they need to reconnect, that they know how to do that, uh, with reconnect with nature, I mean, they know how to do it and they've got the skills to do that, you know, the awareness of how to make that possible. And that we wanted them to have um, an appreciation of the environment. So to go, look, the natural world is important for, for all of us. And I think one way of creating a community of people that will look after the environment as people that spend time in that environment and know that when you go walking in the forest it's important that we have these trails and these trees and these rivers and and these mountains um so yeah so for for my kids you know they've they have grown up in that environment and it hasn't been easy i mean we i'm i'll say to them sometimes you know like it's um you know (laughs) life isn't easy and you, you do have to learn resilience and and just tough it up and we didn't want to raise you know we want our kids to be sort of reasonably hardcore you know we want them to be to be tough and to be able to take a few knocks and mother nature is 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 the best teacher of that you know to to go, yeah, sometimes you do get knocked over, but you just got to stand back up, stand back up and, and get on with it. And, um, you know, and, and you know, as my kids will say, you know, out, the, out in the, you know, they've had some tough, tough experiences that I've had to get through in the outdoors. And, um, yeah, it's just like, you know, you got to take the good with the bad, I think. <laughs> and thus yeah. is life. So yeah. just a few more questions. 
you're an educator. You teach environmental appreciation and 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 preservation. When you're encountering your encountering your students, how do you come alongside them to help them develop that growth mindset you're speaking of? That hey, you got to take the good and the bad. Life will not always be predictable. Not every accomplishment or failure is forecast. And so in those moments when you are interacting with your students, or if they're not students so much in terms of being younger than you than age, but maybe just not having had as much experience, how do you come alongside and nurture that growth mindset? Mm. I think um, just to be clear, as I'm not working in that field anymore, so I was, outdoor education has been my career, but I'm still involved in some levels, but I'm not, on day to day, I don't have contact time with students like I used to. But back when I was out there instructing, I, a really big part of my uh, style of instructing would be to get to know the students quite well personally. So I would always make an effort to spend some one-on-one time with each student, whether we be hiking or, or kayaking in the ocean or whatever it is, to find out their story. Like I would always try and find out, um, you know, just, just, the, just where, how they'd come to be, what, what is the experiences or the pathway that's, that's got this person to where they are now. And I always found that if I could find out uh, where that person was at and, you know, I guess just more about them and what's influenced them, et cetera, that that would help me do my job. And in outdoor education, it's largely about helping facilitate a shift in a person. So wherever they're at, it's about helping them shift from that spot um, forward to a, to another place. So I think it's very important as an outdoor educator is to understand where they're actually at and how far can they actually, what is a realistic shift for that person as opposed to going, um, well, this is where we're going to try and get you to, which might be quite unrealistic. <laughs> so, uh, for, so for me, uh, I guess in terms of helping that person create that shift or that growth, a large part of it would be finding out actually out who they are, but like who is actually a person and, how do they respond to these things and what, what makes them think the way they, they do? What are their beliefs and philosophies? And, and, and you put all that stuff together and then you kind of go, right, so a realistic shift for this person is probably here or here. And then during the course of the program, you would just kind of carefully try and engineer things or facilitate things so that person has the opportunity to kind of, kind of make that shift. A lot of the time, uh, I mean, all outdoor educators are different. I would be on the spectrum of let the experience speak for itself. Mm -hmm. So for me, often just getting people away from everyday life and no phones, no internet, no contact, and just being up on the mountain and summoning a mountain and just taking some time to look at the view, whatever it is we're doing, I would allow time for that person to kind of form their own connection with nature. And sometimes I would do quite little in terms of actual hands-on debriefing facilitation. Other instructors would be quite different. Um, It would be have the experience and then spend a lot of time talking about, okay, you've had the experience. What can you learn from that? How can you apply for that? How can you apply that learning? How do you transfer that learning? Sometimes I would do that, but I would definitely be considered in that outdoor educator space I was definitely more of a, let's go out there and have a real experience and then you guys figure out what that means to you. Well, Nathan, this has been a dynamic and inspiring conversation. And I just want to uh, come to a close with one final question, and that's looking forward to the future. When people look back on Nathan for Avi, what imprint will they see and appreciate? <laughs> Well, I, w- I guess I would hope that, um, you know, people looking back would just that see someone who has just was driven to, you know, do the things that kind of made me happy. Like I, I kind of figured out at quite a young age that there was things in life that didn't make me happy. There was some things in life that made me happy and I just pursued a pathway um, to do that um, and along the way I kind of always believe that as long as you're not harming people as long as you're being a good person as long as you're being generous and sharing um, caring for the environment then chances are you know if you're a good person and live those by those values and philosophies that, that good things will happen to you and um, 
yeah, and, and I kind of feel pretty lucky that, you know, so far that has largely, largely worked out for me. <laughs> Fantastic. Where can people find you in terms of following you, your social media presence, if you could share your handle and your website, also your book title? So my book is, uh, my autobiography is called Adventurer at Heart. Um, it, it was, there wasn't many copies printed. I think they only printed 10,000 paper copies, which sold some years ago. So it is available as an ebook or a Kindle on Amazon. I only just signed up to Instagram a few weeks ago. <laughs> so that is at, at Nathan Fave. It's just basically my name. And then I have a website, which is Nathan, again, it's NathanFave.nz. And then, um, yeah, I think my Facebook is just my name as well. I kind of just keep it pretty simple. <laughs> awesome. If you didn't know who Nathan Fabai was, I hope your introduction to him has only whet your appetite for some more research and not just into his story, but also to adventure activities and sport at large. There are uh, no shortage. There's no shortage of life lessons and principles that we believe will add meaning to your life. Thank you, my friend, for this opportunity. I appreciate you. No, thank you. It's been fun to chat. Listen, everybody, that's all we have for you on this episode of The Living Room. I hope that you have enjoyed listening and enjoyed learning. And based on what we have gleaned, let's live together. Until next time, I'm your host, Richard Martin. Our special guest has been Mr. Nathan Faabai. We'll see you next time.